The following interview was conducted with Michael G. Rossman, the Hanley Distinguished Professor of Biological Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, April 11, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Welcome, Dr. Rossman, and good Thank morning you. to you. Thank you. Good morning. Well, thank you. This is a continuation of the interview, which part one was conducted in March of 2008. Let's talk a little bit, start with your new building, the Hockamer Hall of Structural Biology, where the dedication was in 09. All right. Yeah, I'll talk a little about the, the precursor was Mar the Markey Center, and then some features and equipment in the, of the uh, new hall. So you the would like to be... the, tell some of the features that that you have in the new Hockamer Hall. Some of the features yeah. we yeah. we have. Yeah. Well, I suppose our central piece in there is the new electron microscope, um, which is a state of the art, powerful microscope. It's already been wonderfully useful. Uh, it was a three million grant from the NIH with some matching funds from Purdue. Um, and well, it's it's in the in, we have three floors, and this is on the first floor, the ground level floor. Um, and the ground level floor is sort of we might call something like utilities, not exactly utilities, but uh, central kind of equipment for structural biology. We have the biosafety level two labs, biosafety level three labs there. Um, and uh, some of the offices for, for instance, our systems, computer systems manager is on that floor. Uh, so that's the uh, mm -hmm. um, floor one, the ground level floor. And, uh, floor two and floor three are labs and offices. Uh, on floor two, we also have things like the X-ray lab, a very beautiful X-ray lab. Um, very nice labs, much nicer labs than we've ever had in, in Lilly. Um, we have uh, a special place for, for things like freezers, minus 80 freezers, minus 20 freezers. We have a special room for uh, a series of um, subrooms in uh, for setting up crystals on floor two. Um, uh, it's just a, a very well-equipped structural biology lab. We have about 14 members of faculty, um, <coughs> mostly belonging to biological sciences, but not all, um, uh, have offices and labs in, in the building. So we're all together um, uh, on, on, in this building. It, it's, a, it's great. We have uh, a, a special conference room on, on the um, ground floor, floor one. Um, and uh, my, a smaller conference room on each floor where people meet all the time for various uh, smaller activities. So it's extremely well okay. suited for our kind of work. Were you involved somewhat in the design of it, uh, some of the things in uh, the planning of it? Well, um, design, uh, I did not have too much to do with the design itself. None of, well, not none of us, but Richard Kuhn, uh, the head of the biology department, uh -huh. also structural biology, a very close colleague of mine, um, really did uh, a great deal of the work uh, in, in with the architects. And then people like uh, uh, Paul Chipman, who is our electron microscopist, uh, did a great deal in the terms of the design, special requirements for the electron microscopy. Uh, Tim Schmidt on X-ray crystal uh, crystallography labs, uh, Jeff Berlin had a lot of input on the uh, structure. So a number of us uh, had input with the architects and uh, frequent meetings with the architects. Mm. But I was very lazy. I continued doing my work, and I was very uh, grateful to all the uh, other people who did so much. Is the Markey Center that where you were originally in the Lilly Hall, is that still being used? Well, or the not. Markey Center came about that in about 1986, oh, okay. uh, I applied for a Markey Foundation grant, uh, which was extremely helpful because it allowed us to hire for the first time a series of other people other than myself and a few other people had arrived by that time. Uh, like, for instance, Richard Kuhn was hired on that. Um, so the, the Markey Foundation gave us something like seven million dollars over a period of about that number of years, um, which uh, 
gave us the foundation for creating the structural biology right. faculty. I, I mean, I was there and a number of other people were there sure. before that, but this really expanded uh, structural biology at Purdue at a time which was very critical in, in, the, in structural biology. With other uh, universities were building their structural biology um, buildings and groups uh, to some extent based on what we had done at Purdue. Sure, okay, very nice, okay. Um, now your research focus, let's talk a little bit um, about that. Um, your, uh, start with the Rossman Fold. Can you tell for the research a little bit about that? Um, well, when, when I first came to Purdue, which was in 1964, mm -hmm. uh, I had wanted and, of course, did a uh, start on a study of viruses. This was my great desire. But at that time, the idea of doing uh, significant structural work on viruses at the atomic level, which I wanted to get to, was really uh, a little bit beyond what was likely to be funded, maybe even what was likely to be possible at that time in terms of instrumentation. And uh, I was a new member of the faculty, um, a new member of the American community. I had come from Britain. Um, so it, uh, I really wasn't funded to start on viruses, and I felt it was necessary for me to establish myself as a uh, able scientist uh, in uh, more simpler ways, and therefore I started work on various enzymes, particularly lactate dehydrogenase and subsequently on glycyaldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, with the idea that maybe there is some similarity in structure and similarity in function of these enzymes. They, for instance, both these enzymes I mentioned uh, use a cofactor called NAD or uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, um, which they both use. And that concept turned out to be right. Uh, I had a lot of conversation with a Swedish colleague, Carl Brendin, on this question, and he was studying another dehydrogenase, alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, so we were uh, the first to obtain the structure of a, a, one of these dehydrogenase bound with NAD, and then we got another one, and Carl had one, uh, um, Len Benasek working at Washington University, St. Louis uh, working on melee dehydrogenase, um, and it turned out that uh, there was a, a very significant structural similarity and, and functional relationship, and I, I was able to see this at a time when those ideas were maybe not entirely popular, so uh, I um, emphasized these similarities, emphasized the significance of having a fusion of genes with different uh, components, uh, uh, creating domains in proteins. So this was all new at that time um, uh, with uh, the NAD binding domain uh, having a certain structure which we had found, and that's what some people these days associate with my name. And it is actually, um, and as I sort of suggested at the time, a very frequently occurring uh, fold or, or dom functional domain in the structure of proteins. It's, in fact, the, it's the most common domain I gather from uh, the bioinformatics people. Uh, in the very large amount of information we have as a consequence of human genomes and uh, hundreds of other genomes, which uh, full genomes which have been determined by now, uh, because it is a, a structure which associates proteins and nucleic acids, uh, uh, two of the fundamental kind of compounds which create life. So it's a very common fold, and it, it's the kind of fold which uh, fold of the polypeptide chain, which the um, uh, which the protein makes, uh, folds, uh, creates the, the working structure. Uh, so it's a very common fold, and uh, that's where Very, it came from. That's nice. The uh, rhino, you're the common cold, that virus, talk, uh, that one, make a comment on that. You've been involved yes, with that. Yes. Uh, yeah. So it's a breakthrough, uh, right. we just talked about uh, the uh, dehydrogenase mm -hmm. structures and the significance of what those structures meant. Um, having established that, uh, I felt now I could start on what I really wanted to do, uh, which was work on viruses. 
And again, Purdue was very helpful. Um, well, uh, I'm going too fast. So the first things I started on were uh, viruses of plants because plant viruses can be obtained more easily. Purdue has a series of greenhouses. We use those greenhouses where we could grow uh, various plants on which, which we infected with the virus. We could extract the virus. It was easy to do. We could get the virus in great quantity. So there wasn't so much difficulty in just producing the virus for structural studies. And um, the other part of the work was not just obtaining the virus, was crystallizing virus, which actually wasn't too difficult for the plant viruses. Um, but then solving the structure was a major problem. We had to do a lot of development, how to process, how to collect the X-ray data, how to process the X-ray data, how to determine the structure using the symmetry. All this had to be done. All this was in a kind of development. Oh, it took, uh, say, from uh, say the early 70s to the uh, late 70s, about 10 years, um, to develop these techniques uh, resulting in uh, the first structure of southern bean mosaic virus. And it turned out that uh, Steve Harrison, a, a friend and colleague from Harvard, um, uh, obtained, in fact, the first plant virus, the Media Bushy stunt virus. We obtained our structure about a year later. Uh, and it turned out there was, a, again, a, a structural, functional relationship between these viruses, quite unexpected, but consistent with the kind of ideas which I've been propagating that uh, there's a uh, uh, certain folds have certain functions, and they re uh, repeated over and over again. Nature is basically conservative, um, so this was very exciting. And having, as it were, worked on the easiest kind of virus structure there was, I then went on to more difficult things, and that was dealing with uh, with uh, mammalian viruses, or uh, um, yeah, well, with. Um, uh, viruses which could be more difficult to produce. And uh, here Purdue came in and uh, provided uh, me with laboratory space in the uh, top of the biochemistry building, uh, which we only recently re relinquished when we moved into Hockmar Hall. Uh, and there we did all our cell culture work and were able to produce uh, with uh, help from a colleague, Roland Rückert, in, at the University of Wisconsin, produced um, uh, Rainer Weiss. In fact, it was Roland, Roland Rückert's idea that we, I should work on, on uh, common cold or Rainer Weiss. And it was his idea, and he suggested the particular serotype uh, which we should work on. That, that worked very well. Um, so in 1985, uh, we eventually were able to determine that structure, and it turned out to be extremely interesting. And again, um, the maybe f to me one of the fascinating things was that its structure again bore a resemblance to the structure which we had in the plant virus. You see, uh, Steve Harrison's tomato bushy stunt virus, um, our structure on southern bean mosaic virus, and then the common cold virus were rather similar. And again, the idea that uh, in a virus, you need certain types of functions which uh, have evolved as uh, in, in a kind of a protein which is conserved. Uh, the, it adapts itself to different uh, environments, but otherwise the basic idea is the same. So it's what we see in evolution all the time. Mm, very nice. Uh, you're the molecular motor that... Uh... Well, <laughs> yes, I mean, I'm glad you're raising it in that uh, sequence. Uh, so from uh, yeah. common cold virus, having developed the technology of doing this, uh, we went on to look at a whole variety of other viruses so that uh, while, say, the common cold virus was the first um, animal virus structure ever to be determined, uh, it also provided, had after in a period of about six years, provided a lot of new technology, which we then applied to find other viruses and Roland Rückert, who had mentioned, um, had uh, in our collaboration, we had arranged yearly meetings. We had more meetings than that, but one major meetings, which we call the WISPER, W-I-S for Wisconsin, P-U-R for Purdue, WISPER uh, meetings uh, uh, once a year. And one of his former students, uh, Nina Incardona, 
was working on quite a different kind of virus, uh, bacterial virus. Uh, and uh, bacterial virus, quite a well-known virus called Phyx-174. Uh, it had been used by Fred Sanger, for instance, for, uh, for uh, 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 finding out the, um, determining the genetic code, uh, um, universal genetic code. So uh, through that connection, we started working on um, bacteriophages. And one of the things which many bacteriophages uh, do, maybe not Phyx-174, uh, was to, um, they, uh, contrary to other, probably contrary to other viruses, they assemble their capsid first. So any virus has a capsid, uh, a protein cage, into which, uh, or this cage protects the genomic material a nucleic acid, either RNA or DNA. Um, and uh, more was, well, again, through other connections, I started working on other bacterial phages, in particular T4, uh, by uh, virtue of a relationship with Vadim Mesyanshinov uh, from the University of Moscow in Russia. And there more was known about the details. T4, this is the name of this bacteriophage, the bacterial virus called the bacteriophage. Um, and these phages then, uh, when they knew viruses, uh, next generation viruses, assemble their capsid and they have a motor uh, to package the DNA. So first they build the they make the building and then they fill it with its contents, namely the nucleic acid. And there's a motor, a very strong motor, which pumps the, in this case, the DNA into uh, the capsid. Uh, and the, uh, under, then other kinds of uh, biological molecular motors too, but this particular motor is maybe better understood than most. More work has been done on this and we determined uh, the structure of the, some of the components, both using electron microscopy for the whole motor and crystallography for component parts. Uh, I was doing this in collaboration with uh, Vani Gela Ra, an Indian colleague from, well, he's, he's Indian originally, but he works at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And also my postdoc, Siang Sun, uh, uh, were involved in this work. And that also was very exciting to see how a motor like this uh, can work. And I don't think we've got all the answers yet, but we have some of the answers at least. Mm, very good. And then the other one was that minivirus that... Oh, yeah. um, minivirus. Yeah. Uh, it, the um, virus was fairly recently, maybe uh, something like 10 or 12 years ago, discovered by... Um, a French scientist, Dieter Raoult, who works in Marseille, University of Marseille in southern France. Uh, it's the largest known uh, virus to date, uh, although a lot of other viruses have su were subsequently discovered which were uh, almost as big or, or just as big as a Mimi virus. Uh, it's in, and Mimi virus therefore has a very large genome, so the genome codes for a lot of different functions. And the, um, uh, many of the functions which Mimivirus codes for in its genome are functions which a uh, simple bacterium would, does have. So there isn't much difference in terms of what Mimivirus can do and what uh, a bacteria can do. And so we have to ask what is a virus and what is a the smallest living cell. Is Mimivirus really a small living cell? A uh, difference between, uh, generally speaking, a difference between virus and a, a cell is that a virus is really a parasite. It needs a living cell to replicate yeah. itself. And so uh, you could consider a virus as not being alive because it can't live just by itself. It needs a living cell to, to uh, to, to be alive. To be alive, yes, thank you. Um, uh, but it, 
it can, Mimi Vaz can do almost all the things it has to do by itself. Now, originally, the original definition of Vaz is uh, about um, in the late, 19, uh, late 1800s uh, was a filtratable material, uh, um, a material which at that time could not be seen, visualized, uh, but it, it had infectious properties and it would pass through then the smallest known filters. So that was the original definition of a virus. Yeah. And uh, that's sort of been changed over time. Now it's more in, more in the nature of what is a structure. A mini virus is actually uh, roughly icosahedral. Not every virus is icosahedral, but uh, many viruses are icosahedral. So it has the shape of, a, um, of what is known as a, as a virus. Uh, and then, as I said, a virus uh, does always need a host to, to replicate. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> Your equipment has certainly changed over time. That it, has yeah. make a, it really enhanced the research. Yes. Uh, I mean, what we do is still uh, oh, much I know, the same. But you've got, <laughs> it's, it, it's like the computers, you know. Years ago, they were a lot, you know, we were talking about that recently. It used to be the deck writer. I had one of those, and like 10 bought or printing out, and I used to say, I can go shopping and come back, and it's still going to be printing out. <laughs> yes, yes, right. Um, well, as you say, computing has played a very important oh, part. Sure. And Purdue has been really a uh, very significant uh, partner in this. Uh, you may have heard that uh, when we were dealing with the common cold virus, uh, we switched to what was then a completely new computer, CDC uh, 60, I think 6300 6, computer. Um, it was called a supercomputer, and that was uh, ma made the work possible, really. So what we would otherwise have taken months to do, we could do uh, in a day or so, and that makes a great deal of difference because you can then repeat something right. in a significant time. But if something takes a year to do, you're not so likely to try to do it again and That's better. Right. That's uh, right. And that brings up, yeah. you've got uh, the Rossman supercomputer. Oh, yes. How did that come about? Did they <laughs> well, I suppose... I like that name. <laughs> <laughs> it, it came about because uh, I had at Purdue done a uh, a lot of computing, and I was going to mention that when um, Arthur Hansen was president of uh, Purdue, oh. he, I gather, uh, made it possible uh, through his influence as a president of Purdue to buy this supercomputer, uh, and he, uh, I gather, uh, really in retrospect, that he did that largely, well, I don't know about largely, but it, certainly in part to support the work which we're doing oh, in my lab. A very personable person. Uh, yes, TV. yes. yes. Um, so, uh, I, and throughout the time that I've been here, the uh, uh, computing uh, uh, community at Purdue has been very supportive here. I mean, we've had problems, but oh, sure. without the problems, there would be no need to help me. <laughs> right. If you don't have a problem, then something's wrong, for sure, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. I hear um, you. So uh, the, at this point, the, um, the modern computing uh, is done through computing clusters. The, each node can do some computing, and these different nodes can work in parallel. So that makes it do, possible to do the work faster if you do things in parallel. And then there's always a problem how the different nodes communicate. And that's what's called a cluster. Uh, so the university uh, uh, is has built, put together a cluster. I think the first cluster was called, is called the Steel Cluster. Right. Was John Steele was a uh, head of the, com computer, uh, the science department. computer science for a long time. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the whole of the uh, advanced computing is done through the Rosen Center of Advanced Computing. Um, and uh, Saul Rosen uh, was the first uh, um, head of a computer science center here at Purdue, and he really uh, may, did a lot for computing sure at Purdue. Uh, so the first uh, cluster was called Steel, and the second cu cluster, uh, sort of more modern cluster, was called Coats. And then the, the next cluster, they decided to name after me, I suppose, in recognition <laughs> of uh, my... Get your signature there. <laughs> That's very 
very nice, though. I think so. Now the next cluster is called going to be called Hansen. There, it's not it doesn't exist yet, but uh, <laughs> okay. that's you're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> um, ad you couple of adjunct professorships. Uh, are you still with the Division of Biological Sciences at Cornell, and also you're with the Lafayette Center for Medical Education? Well, um, uh, Cornell. Let's deal with You've Cornell with first. Um, one of the things which we needed, ne still need, uh, for virus crystallography is a very powerful X-ray source. Uh, and in, uh, initially, X-ray crystallography is sort of the structural part of the work which we do. Um, it was done on home X-ray tubes, so just like you have in a hospital. Well, similar to what you have in a hospital. Right. They're X-ray things. Uh, but the, uh, obviously what you have in a hospital are not very intense x-rays because you don't want to kill your patients. And, um, we need very intense x-rays. And uh, various colleagues around the world started to realize that uh, when physicists uh, do their experiments with uh, studying the, um, the um, structure of atoms, uh, they have these atom smashing machines uh, called a synchrotron where you make electrons go around in a circle at a, near the speed of light, and then they smash into each other and smash into the, the nuclei of atoms. But this process produces X-rays. And so as a byproduct of the physics experiments, uh, people started saying, well, let's use the, the uh, X-rays, the very intense X-rays, which are produced in this process. And one place where they started doing this was Cornell University. Uh, and the, uh, the people at Cornell were one of the first to build such a um, parasitic uh, process of uh, using the X-rays. It was called, is called CHESS, or uh, Cornell High, C-H-E-S-S, -S, Cornell High Energy Synchrotron Source. And we were one of the first major users of that source. There, there weren't many such places, maybe yeah. only about two or three in yeah. the world at that time. That was in the early 80s. Uh, now, Synchrotrons, now this process worked, and synchrotrons are being built and have been built and are being used uh, uh, throughout the world, for which are dedicated synchrotrons, where the, nothing to do with doing physics experiments, that just made in order to make very high intense X rays. And there is such a source, the uh, advanced photon source in at the Argonne National Lab in Chicago, which we mostly use these days. So we don't go to Cornell anymore. Anyway, this relationship with Cornell, where we used to go maybe once every second month. There was a, quite a journey. Uh, we had to drive there, take about 12 hours to drive there in a van, and we took all our, our equipment with us. Uh, we stayed maybe for two weeks at Cornell and did our experiments and came back. Uh, and uh, this was, uh, well, it was very successful, it was very enjoyable in many ways, did a lot of work in that process. Uh, but I started having an association with Cornell, and right. uh, in respect of that, uh, I was appointed as an adjunct professor at Cornell, which is a position I guess I still have. I'm not even sure that they st still remember that. <laughs> uh, well, I suppose they, they do. They may call you someday. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and the other, the, um, Lafayette, uh, the Indiana uh, Association was, well, uh, there's a, the Howard Hughes Medical uh, Institute uh, is uh, maybe the largest philanthropic um, medical institution in North America now. And uh, when they got started initially, I was actually on their um, scientific advisory board for 10 years in, in when they got started. But to obtain funding from that, it was necessary to have an appointment with a uh, medical institution. Oh, okay. That's different now. Uh, we are very fortunate now to have Ju Chen here, one of my younger colleagues who has a Howard Hughes uh, how to use financial support. But I was hoping to get some of that f funding, but I never did. But that was the reason I uh, became associated with uh, did, did you ever do any teaching with that program at all? For the, uh, uh, the well, it depends what you mean by teaching. Oh, In okay. a formal okay. sense of classroom teaching, no. Okay. Uh, but of course, te I do teaching sure. all the time. Oh, yeah. I understand. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of the uh, Talk about that one about the University of Glasgow. You got that Doctor of Science. University that, of? That Glasgow. Oh, Glasgow. Yes. Uh, well, That's I was right. a PhD student at the University of Glasgow. And okay. uh, uh, subsequently, I was honored with an honor degree. 
That's very nice. And the Purdue University Medal of Honor, would you comment on that? I'm not familiar with that particular one. It's a, so Purdue, a Medal of Honor, Purdue University. You got one of those? Was on one of oh, oh, yeah. You this is uh, uh, Steve Baring uh, gave this to me. About at, 1995? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, this was my uh, 65th birthday, and they decided to celebrate that here, and it was a very nice occasion. And um, he kindly uh, honored me in this way. That's very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Um, are you, you've been on the National Science Board, and of course, Dr. Baring was the president of that at one, the head at one time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Were you on the board the same time that he was? I, I was on the board at the same time as Steve was. Um, in fact, I was a teller for the election where he was. Uh, <laughs> Interesting. Um, became the uh, chair of the board. Sure. Um, and we. You know, this meant going to Washington about every second month for a few days, and we often traveled together, so I got to know him quite well in that yeah. way. It was nice. It was a nice yeah. run down there. Yeah. Um, the National Institute of Health Merit Award, a third oh, yes. one, could you comment uh, on that? Well, the, uh, you know, in the normal process, uh, you apply for a grant to the National Institute of Health. Uh, the usually the longest duration is five years. Other grants are maybe only three years or even one year. Um, and um, so I think it was 1980. Uh, so every uh, I have a number of grants from NIH, uh, but the oldest of these grants was one which um, I had have had continuously, more or less, ever since I've been here. Uh, that's since about 19, even before that, 1963, I think it started. So um, right after we determined the structure of the common cold virus, uh, it was time to renew it. I think it was about 1986. Um, and occasionally, if you get a very good review, uh, they make it into what they call a meritist. I'm not meritorious. I'm not sure what all the letters stands for, but it, it's an acronym which they like. Right. I, I um, figured it was. So that what the the great thing about a merit award is, it's they make a, what was applied for as a five year grant make it into a ten year grant. Um, so uh, well, I got this. That saves a lot of time. <laughs> yes. Well, it means you're not worried about renewal. It means you can think much further afield. I, if you don't get uh, immediate results, it doesn't matter because you can make that up. But it means you can maybe be more ambitious in your in your thinking. Uh, so I got this merit award, I think, in 1986. Then it had to be renewed, of course, 10 years later, which would be 1996. Uh, and uh, I received another merit award. And uh, so it had to be renewed in 2006. And I got another merit award, which is um, what I'm working on now. So that will take me to 2016. Oh, that sounds good. So that means a total of 30 years of support of that kind, Wonder. which I'm very happy with. Your funding uh, over time, has it been leveled or what? There are peaks and valleys, probably? Um, it's been fairly leveled, yes. Okay. Uh, uh, right. NIH has been a very strong supporter. NIH and NSF, yeah. NSF. Uh, but NSF support, it was very good at the, at the beginning when I came mm -hmm. to Purdue. Uh, but it hasn't changed. And of course, the money value has changed. Sure. Uh, when I was on the board of NSF, uh, the, of the National Science Board, which is over, overviews NSF, right. I tried hard to uh, get them to change it so that uh, to make the awards larger, more significant, because it was very significant, but now they're sort of uh, uh, awards to individual scientists have diminished. They make very large awards for group things, like they, they right. for instance, they explore Antarctica, they make uh, icebreakers, they uh, make telescopes, which is all very important. Uh, they also support synchrotrons. But uh, in my opinion, the, the backbone of scientific support goes to the individual creative scientist. He needs or she needs instrumentation for sure, but uh, that can be done. But where the creativity is, is the individual human being, right. and that needs support. And NSF has failed, in my opinion, to follow that through. 
Um, Whereas years ago, this was the case, right? From an individual was more, more the individual type grant. Yeah, the the, yeah. Days. I mean, they make uh, uh, quite they a significant do, number of individuals, focus. but their grants are short in duration, small in quantity, uh, uh, small in, in the financial sure. amount, uh, and that I don't think they're enough. That that is where they should. That should be the first place they should be supporting. Instead, they uh, support a lot of centers. There's some need for these centers, but I think it's also a little frivolous. Uh, centers obviously support a whole group of people, and that means uh, you're not concentrating on the individual creativity of the individual. I don't think these centers are as fruitful. I mean, necessary maybe in part, but uh, uh, as f the, in my opinion, the center of creativity in science, in art, in uh, writing, uh, is the individual creative person, and right. that should need, get right. the first support. Right, good point. Um, any hobbies? Hobbies, yeah. well. <laughs> uh, running, we know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, running, I, I do, my, one of my hobbies has been backpacking Ooh, in, okay. in the Rockies, um, and um, hiking, if you like. I go sailing, I have a sailboat, I race it on summer weekends. Um, Where do you keep it? Do you keep it at Lake Freeman. Oh, that's nice. Um, that's a close lake. That's yes, nice. yeah. yeah we, the, I'm a member of the Lafayette Sailing Club, have been for a long time, almost in this foundation. Um, what else? Um, oh, skiing, yeah. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. Now this year, this year my skiing got cut short because I had this problem with Achilles. <laughs> and I was about to go for a week in Utah, but a week earlier I, I ruptured my Achilles. <laughs> you got tendon. zapped there, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Um, the final thing, collaboration for the researchers. I thought you'd make a couple comments. Like you worked with what Cornell, you spoke earlier, and then Catholic University and SUNY collaboration. Uh, well, I've had obviously here. a very uh, large number of uh, good friends. I mean, these people become very good, lifelong right. friends. Uh, I've mentioned Roland Rickert, uh, um, Vinny Gallagher mm -hmm. at Catholic University, but there's also been others. Uh, Richard Kuhn I've worked with very extensively, right. uh, very extensively. And, and you've got colleagues here, but I mean, the, oh, it, which you collaborated with. In, at Purdue? Sure. Right. Well, I think Richard is probably the person with whom I've collaborated mostly uh, with at Purdue. Sure. Uh, I, obviously, I've worked with other people, right. uh, the, the, I mean, like closer colleagues like Janet Smith, uh, Ju Chen, I think I mentioned, is a Howard Hughes supported person, um, and Tim Baker, who was our. Uh, um, microscopist here, and uh, Wen Chiang is our microscopist. Now, there are lots of people with right, whom I've yeah. worked over time, and as I said, the, to me, uh, science is, is very interesting, but the colleagues uh, and friends one makes in the process all over the world is, is also a very significant part uh, of that, you know, the international community of right, scientists, yeah. which I think supersedes all kinds of political differences, and uh, you really get to know it's person. It's good for the yeah. where the I mean, For instance, uh, this summer I will be going to China uh, to a meeting of the Chinese Society of Biological Investigators. Okay. Uh, is this your first trip to China, or have you been there before? Uh, I've been there many times before, oh, okay. but I feel very honored that the group of Chinese scientists, uh, admittedly working outside China mostly, but that they should ask me to be one of their plenary speakers. Very I'm nice. I'm not Chinese. I don't speak Chinese, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. I think that brings it to the end, but anything that I forgot to ask or anything that you'd like to add? <laughs> you tell uh, us a little about, you're looking forward to the, uh, how long are you going to be in China? You're gonna uh, be that'll around? just be a little over a week. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. okay. But that's very nice. Yeah. And uh, I'll have to touch base with me when you come back. Okay. okay. Well, thank thank you, you very much. Thank you, Dr. Rossman. I appreciate that. <coughs>